Hi everyone, Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. We've been talking about the Word of God and its importance in our life. Last week, I began by saying, without the knowledge of God's Word both activated and implemented in our life, we're not going to make it in these last days. Church, how many of you know we need to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth if we're going to navigate through the deception of the times that we're living in? In last week's lesson, we studied the value of God's Word, and we covered five points describing it. Number one, God's word has value because it's eternal. Number two, God's word has value because it is unchanging. Number three, God's word has value because it is perfect. Number four, because it provides divine guidance and instruction for life. And number five, God's word has value because it is the revelation of God himself. Now, today I want to talk to you about the validity of God's Word. Church, the validity of God's Word is found in its veracity. Now, veracity speaks of truthfulness, its virtue, its truth, and its accuracy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus prayed to the Father saying, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Church, listen, if you want to live unshaken in a world where everything all around you that can be shaken will and is being shaken right now, then you need to be anchored. You need to be tethered, beloved, to the truth of God's word. Amen? In order to do that, we have to first believe that the word of God is the truth. As believers in Christ, you and I need to hold on to the integrity of God's word each and every day. Do you know what I mean, church, by the integrity of God's word? A dictionary might define integrity as uncompromising adherence to moral and ethical principles. Uncompromising adherence to moral and ethical principles. Church, we can be sure that God's word has an uncompromising adherence. In other words, it has a firm grip, a firm stance on what is morally and ethically right in all things. The word of God being uncompromised means it is unyielding in its truth. It will not bend. Church, here's the reality. God, the true living God, wrote a book. And you know how he did it? He used the power of the Holy Spirit to inspire men to write what he needed to say. Now, in this book written by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God said everything that he wanted to say to us, everything you and I need to know about life and godliness, everything we need to know about morality and about truth is all written in this book. Now, you may argue that point, especially if you're placing your trust in the wisdom of men over the wisdom of God. But understand this, beloved. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us, he who comes to God, in other words, he who draws near to God in order to obtain something, to get some understanding, to get some grace, to get some favor, he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So the question I have for you today is this, who are you seeking? Who are you seeking for truth? Because here's the truth. The well that you are drawing from for your wisdom is the well that you are diligently seeking. You know, it's so sad today 
how so many people put the words of mere men before the word of the living God. Sadly, so many do not understand or actually choose not to accept the validity of God's word. Church, the Bible, listen, is distinct from every other book ever written in that God is the one who wrote it. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God, meaning God inspired and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Beloved, you can trust God's word to tell you the truth because it is backed up by the very nature of God himself. God, church, is a truth teller. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 tells us, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Church, God backs up his word by the very nature of who he is. God's word is the one true source of moral objective truth. Truth that is fixed. Truth that is settled and unwavering because it is backed up, held up by the very nature of God himself. Now, by definition, objective truth is something that is true for everyone, whether they agree with it or not. You know, at one time, it's funny. This was simply called truth. That's how truth was thought of. But this changed, beloved, when the world adopted a new philosophy, a new way of reasoning called postmodernism. Postmodernism had begun as a radical fringe movement in the 1970s, but became the dominant view of the 1980s. By definition, postmodernism is a philosophy that affirms no objective or absolute truth, especially in matters of religion and spirituality. Postmodernism, beloved, can be summed up in the statement, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. What is dangerous about this philosophy is that it attempts to undermine the validity of God's word. And we have a generation today, it's so sad, that have been shaped by this very belief. But I must tell you, beloved, in all of its efforts, this philosophy fails. Because God's word stands true, regardless of our opinion of it. Despite what many people in our culture believe today, God's truth is not subjective, meaning it doesn't bend according to the way one feels. It is truth for everyone. I like how one Bible scholar puts it. People may believe or disbelieve the Bible, but no one has the power or the prerogative to establish truth or to change it. It is fixed. Once for all, the word of God is settled forever, forever in heaven. See, beloved, we have to understand the word of God doesn't evolve. The word of God is not evolving. It is fixed. It is forever settled. It doesn't change with the times. He goes on to say, this is profoundly essential. That's an important distinction we must not miss. The truth did not come from man. Man may discover, learn, understand, and apply it, but man has nothing to do with its origination. Church, listen, you and I, we can trust in the integrity of God's word. We can count on it. Because what God has said in his holy book is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but 
the truth. As I said last week, God means what he says, and he says what he means. First John chapter 5, verse 20. It says here, and we know that the Son of God has come. Let me ask you a question, church. Do you know? Do you know, beloved, that the Son of God has come? Of course, you see, you have to understand something. The guys that were writing all of this down, they knew. They knew. They encountered Jesus. They encountered the living Christ firsthand. You see, church, you have to understand, this is where the revelation of the truth of God begins. Unless you know that the Son of God has come, everything I'm sharing with you is going to be up for grabs for you. Because truth begins, beloved, with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the truth. See, unless you've got that peace embedded in your heart, you'll be groping in the dark. The revelation of the truth begins, beloved, with the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ is what brings you into the knowledge of the truth. Because without him, beloved, you won't get it. Why? Because without him, our understanding is darkened. Without him, our understanding is darkened because of sin. And only Jesus has the power to lift that veil off of us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20 affirms this saying, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now notice, beloved, in this passage, Jesus doesn't say you will know a truth. He says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Church, the word of God is no respecter of persons. What it says to one, it says to all. God's word is trustworthy because God's word is the truth. The apostle Peter teaches us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, scripture did not come by the will of man, but by those moved by the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for moved here means to be carried, to be moved or prompted inwardly. Now, as I said, we have to understand, we're living in a society, church, that does not share this belief. We live in a culture today that places very little value and very little validity on God's word and Christianity as a whole, for that matter. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo wrote an article for an online news source I'd like to read to you called Harbinger's Daily on May 25th, 2023. So this was just a couple of months ago. And the title reads this, Biden administration sees religion as an unfortunate feature of a backward society trapped in the past. Here in this article, he writes about Nigerian Christians being slaughtered because of their religious beliefs. 
and how this violent persecution persecution happening now is largely being ignored by the Biden administration and the Nigerian government. Listen to these alarming statistics. Last year, according to the Human Rights Group, Open Doors, 90% of Christians murdered for their faith worldwide were killed in Nigeria. Church, could you believe that? 90% were killed in Nigeria. This staggering number, he says, is up from 80% just one year before. Christians comprise nearly half the population of Nigeria. It is the most populous country in Africa by far. Yet the Nigerian government continues to deny this religious persecution in fear of radical Islamic militants pouring in through their northern border. Pompeo goes on to say, outrageously, the Biden administration continues to affirm this denial instead of, uh, of holding the Nigerian government accountable as we did in the Trump administration. We knew Nigeria was tolerating the systematic violent persecution of its Christians. My team and I at the State Department placed Nigeria's government on the countries of particular concern list. That's called the CPC list. It's a list that the government has that red flags countries that they have to keep their eye on. And he said, so that we could impose, they put them on this list so that we could impose serious consequences if it did not confront the evil extremist groups metastasizing within its borders. Unfortunately and predictably, Team Biden not only reversed our good work, but also failed to replace it with anything meaningful. Instead, this administration considered funding a woke documentary which AIM was too, and now he quotes from the creators of the documentary that define the purpose of their do documentary. Listen, so it's a woke documentary, which AIM was to, quote, penetrate and analyze the complex and rather phony religious charade that has come to define a large part of Nigerian society. End quote. Pompeo states, the Biden administration's approach is intentional. Its continued failure to fight for religious freedom abroad is symptomatic of the progressive ideology to which it subscribes. Top leaders in this administration simply do not believe that religion matters. They view religious faith as either one of many different cultural characteristics or as an unfortunate feature of a backward society trapped in the past. Now pay attention to what he says next. Progressive ideology demands its adherents discount the truth and value of religious faith and instead view every conflict through the prisms of race, ethnicity, and gender. So church, this is what we're facing in our nation today. This is what's coming against, attacking the validity of God's word. Progressive ideology is demanding that its adherents discount the truth and the value of religious faith, and instead view every conflict through the prisms of race, ethnicity, and gender. Church, we see news narratives being written every day to promote this agenda so that Christians are being viewed as backward, intolerant, and uninformed, and to cause people today to see the word of God as invalid and untrustworthy. 
But you know what, beloved? None of this should take us by surprise. How many of you know the Bible teaches there is nothing new under the sun? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, King Solomon said in verse 9, What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Church, the attacks on Bible inerrancy today are nothing new. What we as believers in Christ need to understand today is that historically, from the early church, the church always held to the belief that the Bible is accurate and inerrant. It wasn't until liberal theologians injected their ideas, especially since the post-Darwin era, that the inerrancy of the Bible, its authority, and its infallibility came into question. But sound orthodoxy was always, beloved, able to push back on these ideas. And Bible inerrancy remained the standard upon which evangelical believers in Christ stood. But then came the 1960s. And the very foundations of our traditional Judeo-Christian ethics continued to be challenged by progressive liberal institutions. Now, without getting into a lot of history, dedicated biblical scholars saw the writing of the wall, and they began to come together to refute these progressive ideas and these progressive arguments against the inerrancy of God's word. And in 1978, they met in Chicago, and they formed a summit to meet regarding the defense of Bible inerrancy. And it was a call to action for the church to arise and to defend the faith, defend its belief in the accuracy and inerrancy of Scripture, to defend the truth of Scripture as God breathed and not man initiated. The reason evangelical Bible scholars came together is because the scripture, beloved, was under attack. So what's happening today all around us is nothing new. As scripture said, there is nothing new under the sun. But what we must understand is this. Never before church could lies and deceit and misinformation spread through society as swiftly as it does today because of technology. So when we see scripture attacked on every front like we're seeing today, we must realize as the body of Christ that we are being called to stand up and defend it. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Church, now more than ever, we need to be equipped to offend to defend, rather, what we believe and why we believe it. Amen? Satan roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He preys, beloved, upon the misinformed, those lacking knowledge of God's word. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. There is no error in the revelation of God's word. There's only error in man's interpretation of it. Beloved, listen, you can rest assured any discrepancies people may argue would fall on the side of man's limited understanding of what he is reading, not God's unlimited knowledge of what he wrote. You know, through the centuries, the Bible time and time again proves to be true when standing up to the discoveries of the modern age, and the, especially in the discoveries of modern science. 
Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time laboring over the science, but I want to quickly give you three scientific proofs recorded in the Bible way before scientists ever discovered them. There are many, many more proofs, beloved, but for the sake of time, we're going to just take a quick look at three of them. Three scientific facts that were written way before the field of science discovered it. These were written in the Bible way before science discovered them. First is the law of, of gravity. Did you know that the Bible recorded the truth about gra gravity? The Bible recorded the truth about gravity way before Sir, Sir Isaac Newton discovered it. Job chapter 26 verse 7 says, He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. Now for centuries, many believed with great conviction the exact opposite. They believed nothing on this earth just floats. Everything other than the clouds themselves were situated on something. And as a result, ancient civilizations believed that the earth had to be suspended on something. And it wasn't until Sir Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravity in 1687 that this statement in Job made sense. Newton made the distinction between the Earth's gravitational pull and the lack thereof in outer space. Now, the book of Job has been dated as the oldest book of the Bible, being 3,500 years old. Church, understand, Job was a shepherd. He raised livestock. He wasn't a scientist. He didn't have the resources we have today to study the universe. The truth is this. The author of Job didn't write this book from his own thoughts. It was written through the inspiration of God that the book of Job was written down 3,500 years ago. Another scientific proof of the Bible deals with the water cycle of the earth. Now, the water cycle shows us the continuous movement of water within the earth and the atmosphere. Liquid water evaporates into water vapor and condenses into the clouds and then precipitates back to the earth in the form of rain and snow, right? We experience this cycle every day, though, you know, the truth is most of us would never be able to explain it at least not scientifically. Job records in chapter 26, verse 8, he, speaking of God, wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. And then in Job, Job 36, verses 27 and 28, he writes, he, again, speaking of God, draws up the waters or draws up the drops of water which distill as rain to the streams the clouds pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on mankind now let's break down these verses scientifically draws up drops of water is referring to evaporation distill as rain to the streams is talking about precipitation. Clouds pour down their moisture is describing condensation. Now, all of this may seem like no big deal to us today because a lot of us learned some of these principles in school. But understand, church, this water cycle wasn't understood scientifically until, are you ready? About 400 years ago. And Job was written when? 3,500 years ago. Now, the third scientific proof I want to share with you this, this day is regarding the Earth's core. Now, I personally find this one the most fascinating 
Job chapter 28, verse 5 says, As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Now, you can try to argue that Job must have been a really observant guy to figure out the water cycle. But the earth's core? <laughs> Come on, church. How could this guy see the earth's core? LiveScience.com published an article on June 18th, 2015, stating this. Pay attention. Biblical views of the center of the earth as a hellish pit raging with fire and brimstone have some support from new research. Scientists have found that the vast majority of brimstone reverently referred to in biblical times as burning stone, but now more commonly known as sulfur, dwells deep in the earth's core. Church, make no mistake, the Bible wasn't written by the knowledge of men. It was written by the inspiration of God. It is accurate and inerrant. The attack on Bible inerrancy today is nothing new. Church, this is a demonic attack. And it comes straight out of Satan's playbook, seeking to undermine the validity of God's word. Paul warns us in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 tells us, the natural man understands not the things of God. To him, they are foolishness. They are spiritually discerned, and he is spiritually dead. Church, listen, the only cure for this spiritual deadness and this lack of spiritual discernment is the revelation of Jesus. You see, church, in the heart of every human being is opposition, hostility to the word of God. Romans chapter 8 verses 6 and 7 tells us, So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always, listen, hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. So in our natural state, we have a big dilemma. A dilemma, beloved, that only faith in Christ and what he has done for us on the cross can resolve. So if we're going to hold the word of God as truth and inerrant, we must possess, beloved, the revelation of Christ in our hearts. Because without him, our understanding is darkened. Paul warns us of this condition, this spiritual condition in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, Paul writes, With the Lord's authority I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Now you may be sitting there wondering, how could I be so certain of all of this? Well, here's the truth, beloved. I was once there. My life has been radically changed by the one who wrote this book. You see, we can spend this entire session sharing scripture and statistics about the truth and the accuracy of scripture. 
But until you receive him, until you receive the revelation of Christ, hear me, for you, all of this are just words. Words that you will naturally dismiss from the well of information, the ideology, or the philosophy that you draw from. So my word to us today, and for those of you who are struggling, is this. Repent. Repent, beloved, and change your well. Begin to draw life from the living waters that only Christ can give you. Then you will be able to hear and you will be able to see what God's spirit, the spirit of truth, is saying to us through his holy word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving us your holy word. Thank you, Lord, that you desired for your children to not grope in darkness. But you gave us your word to be an entrance of light into our hearts and into our minds. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you wrote this holy book. And we believe this by faith, O oh God. And we thank you for the immutable proofs that you have given to us to show us that your word is true. And the greatest proof, Lord, that we have, that we know your word is true, is the revelation of Jesus Christ as it is revealed in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for showing us the Father. Thank you for your obedience for showing us that this is a living word and that by faith we can receive all that the Father has given to us. So we cry out. We cry out for one another. We cry out for those today who may still have the veil over their eyes, that you, Lord Jesus, would remove the veil. Give them the gift of tears. Help them see you as you truly are. Holy Spirit, Convict the heart. Show us Christ today. That there can be salvation in the house of God. That there could be healing in the house of God. That there could be deliverance right now in the house of God. As Jesus is made known through the scriptures. For you said, Lord Jesus, that you are the way. You are the truth and you are the life. In you and you alone, there is no other. So bless all those who are watching with the revelation of you that they can possess for themselves the validity of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved. I will see you next week. Thank you for joining us this week as we study God's word together. For those of you watching on YouTube, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the like button. I want to encourage those of you who haven't done so already, please join us on our official online church platform. There you can watch our weekly messages when they go live, as well as connect with our church family. Also, don't forget to check out our website at faithcc.com where you can receive additional messages and see our upcoming services. At this time, I want to thank all of you who have been supporting our church and ministry with your financial giving. Guys, you are a blessing to us. Together, we are able to fulfill our mission, which is to transform individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. If you would like to give now, please follow the prompts on your screen. At this time, once again, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want us all to remember, church, as we go through this week, that together we are living truth, changing lives, and loving God. 
God bless you.